Welcome to the final video in Calculus 1 on antiderivatives. Basically, we have a fancy definition here that says f is an antiderivative on interval i if and only if f prime of x is equal to little f of x for all x in i. Now, this is a little bit technical and unnecessary. Basically, an antiderivative is the opposite of a derivative. If we have a function f of x, then we can take its derivative, and there you have a derivative. So you have a function, and we go down to have a derivative. What this says is we have a function f of x, and instead of taking its derivative, we actually go the opposite way. And this is called the antiderivative. Now, you might be familiar with something called integration. So you can take the integral of f of x, and this is equal to some big f of x plus a constant, and this is the exact same idea. In fact, integration is really just taking the antiderivative. So let's get into this. Consider f of x is equal to 2x. Find its antiderivative. Well, suppose, okay, 2x. What do we know happened when we take a derivative? Well, this power comes down and you subtract 1. So let's rewrite this as 2x to the 1. This looks like it used to be x squared. Let's take f of x to be x squared. Let's take its derivative, and it does, in fact, equal 2x. Therefore, its antiderivative is x squared. However, we're not quite done yet. If I were to take some constant value like 9, and I took its derivative, it would still be 2x. What if I made it x squared minus pi? still 2x. Therefore, we say that the antiderivative is x squared plus c, where c is some constant. And people will lose marks for this constant missing on so many exams. I can tell you a million times, do not forget this c. Professors will tell you in class, do not forget the c. Regardless, you're going to forget the c at least once. And you don't need to feel bad about it, but you should make an active you should make an active attempt to never do that. Anyways, uh, moving on, let's do some more antiderivatives. Let's find five antiderivatives. Now the key is to go through your head and think of all the different functions, quickly take the derivative and see if it matches anything you have in the list. And if that fails, well, let's give you the answers to some of these then. 1 over x is the same thing as taking the derivative of the natural log of x plus some constant. So if we take ln x, we take its derivative, then we get 1 over x. e to the x, well, the derivative of e to the x is always itself, so the antiderivative of e to the x is also itself. If we take sine theta, what do we need to differentiate to get sine theta? We need to take cosine of theta and the negative plus c, and when we differentiate that, we'll get sine theta. For cosine of theta, it's a little bit simpler. All we need to do is take the derivative of sine theta plus some constant to get cosine of theta. So its antiderivative is going to be sine theta. x to the n is a little bit interesting. We know that if we want to take its derivative, we get nx to the n minus 1. Therefore, we're going to get x to the n plus 1. But we're also going to have to divide by n plus 1. This might seem a little bit not intuitive. But think about its derivative. We have then x to the n 
and we bring n plus 1 outside, therefore we have to divide by n plus 1 to get them to cancel. We now have this interesting function, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, but is that all? No, that's not all. I want you to think for a second. What is x to the negative 1? x to the negative 1 is equivalent to 1 over x. And we know the antiderivative of this is the natural log of x. Therefore, we have to set in the condition that n is not equal to 1. There's five very common antiderivatives you're going to be working with. More advanced ones you will not learn how to do in this course. You'll learn how to do it in Calculus 2. In fact, that is basically what half the course is teaching you to do, is techniques for finding antiderivatives. But there is still one more application that we have to do before this course is over. Let's do some physics stuff. You should remember this, that if we have a position function, we can take its derivative to get velocity, and we can take the derivative of velocity to get acceleration. Now that we have antiderivatives, we can go backwards. We can start with a acceleration function, and we can go to velocity and position. Antiderivates. I did not even spell that word right. How sad. What you might be thinking is you say, well, okay, if we take the antiderivative of a of t, we get v of t plus some constant. Well, how do we find out what the constant is? Don't we need the constant to figure out s of t? And the answer is yes. So, in this problem coming up, we get some conditions. We get what the velocity at 0 is equal to, and we get the position at 0. Let's figure out how to do this. a of t is equal to 6t plus 4. Let's take an antiderivative. v of t. Now, 6t, when we take something's derivative, we're going to get 6t. It's going to be a t squared. Now, what times 2 is equal to 6? We have 3 times 2 is equal to 6. Okay. Now, we're going to get plus 4t. We basically, when we have a constant, we just stick a variable in front of it. And we have some constant c, and we don't know what c is. But we know that v0 is equal to negative 6. Now, let's plug in 0 to all of our t values here. We have 3 times 0 plus 4 times 0 plus c, which is just equal to c. Therefore, we can claim that c is equal to negative 6. Therefore, we can say that the velocity function is 3t squared plus 4t minus 6. Now we can take the position function by taking the antiderivative of the velocity function. This is going to be t cubed. If you take its derivative, you'll get 3t squared plus 2t squared. Again, if you take this derivative, you'll get 4t minus 6t plus some constant d. Don't use c. I only say don't use c because in the technical paper you don't want to use the same variable for two completely different things. We have different variables for different things. So use d, use epsilon alpha. You can use whatever you want. If you want, you can draw a little piggy and you can solve for the little piggy if you want. In fact, for the sake of illustration and the fact that this is the very last video in the series, I will solve for piggy. Okay. We know that s of 0 is equal to 9. So let's plug 0 into all of our t's, which we're going to end up with piggy here. Let's see how fast I can draw this. There's piggy. Those are terrible ears. I'm so sorry. Therefore, we have that our piggy is going to be equal to 9. 
In the end, we have our position function is going to be t cubed plus 2t squared minus 6t plus 9. And this is our function. And they might ask us to do things with this function, like what is the position at time 8. And you could plug in 8 and you can see what you can get. Or they could say, well, what is the height of the ball when the velocity is negative 2. And you could check the height by plugging in the velocity of negative 2 and solving for this position function, blah blah blah, and eventually you'll get your result. I'm not going to ask you that, but in an exam or in your homework, yeah, you might get asked that. Of course, the good thing about antiderivatives is you have a very easy way of checking your answer. So s of t is equal to t cubed plus 2t squared minus 6t plus 9. Let's just take the derivatives quickly. This is 3t squared plus 4t minus 6. And the acceleration is going to be 6t plus 4. Now, if we check these functions, we will see that they do, in fact, all match up. Therefore, the antiderivative is at least slightly right. We know it's slightly right. <laughs> we don't know if it's perfectly right because our constants might be off. But if we're just trying to solve for the general equation, I'm going to bite my tongue a bit when I say this, but it, it doesn't really matter if your constant's a little bit off. If you're trying to solve a question as an application, of course it matters if your constant's right. But if you're just finding a general function, if your constant's off by 0.5 or 1, it's not going to make a huge difference. Anyways, congratulations. You've now completed the basis of Calculus 1. The series, as far as videos go, are now over. At some point, I might return to do a couple supplementary videos, redo some old videos once I get better at this, and... Uh, I'll probably also do some midterms and finals and throw them in here, but my main focus now is going to be doing the 1001 Calculus Problems for Dummies, finish the Calculus 1 section, start working on the Calculus 2 course, and finish up Natural Deductive Logic. So if you're listening to this in the future and those things are already done, then it's probably about time I come back and look at these videos again and see if I can improve on any of the older videos that I did. As always, if you have any questions or there was a topic that wasn't covered in your Calculus 1 course that you need to have discussed on this channel, leave it in the comments and I will append it to this video series and include whatever else you need in Calculus 1, whether it be more examples, more topics, more in-depth ex explanations, or even just a redo of some topic that perhaps you don't think I covered correctly. So leave those in the comments and... Thanks for watching the Calculus 1 series. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you watched it the whole way through, if you just picked up a video and watched it, yeah, that's awesome. Whatever you need, man, just leave feedback and I will take it as seriously as I possibly can.